Hi, my friends. Welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, your host and also an indie author. I'm thrilled you're joining me today for another fun interview with a passionate author. We're going to kick off this show with an exciting reading, so let's get started. Hi, my name is Danielle M. Morsino. I'm author of Birth of the Fae, Locked Out of Heaven, Volume 1, Book 1, the first book in the Birth of the Fae series. And today I'll be reading for you Chapter 26, Page 150, Worship Equals Power. Jarvok watched from the throne room as Zion took them through spear patterns and self-defense. Jarvok tried to keep the weepers on a strict routine and training schedule. He had found this worked best for their emotional and mental stability. Adjusting to the abandonment had not been easy for the weepers, as it had been for the others. They required a regimented lifestyle, the hive mentality the power brigade had provided. Jarvok remained hopeful these powers would acclimate to their new lives and fall into rank. He had set up training exercises to keep the soldiers busy and put Zion and Asa in charge. All this had helped, but they compulsively picked at their angelite disc scars, causing them to reopen and bleed. The blood ran down from their forehead and past their eyes, giving them the illusion of crying, thus the nickname, the weepers. He was rethinking this as he watched from above. Perhaps they needed a distraction or he wasn't utilizing their talents properly. Jarvok called for his smaller dragon. Los was 95 years old, a young dragon. His ability to camouflage, much like a chameleon, was growing stronger and he could control it a little bit longer as he aged. While many dragons didn't develop their oral defenses until they were 100 years old, they had passed certain developmental milestones at 85, 90, and 95 to indicate they were developing properly. Fire breathers were the exception developing much earlier than any other dragon. If Los was going to develop any oral defenses like acid or ice, Jarvok believed it would have demonstrated in some indication. Los had a growth spurt, had one in the spring, and he was now roughly the size of a juvenile red wolf. He wouldn't grow much bigger. Therefore, he stayed close to Jarvok and Dragor, acting as Jarvok's gopher. Los was loyal and dependable, he delivered messages throughout the stronghold and with his camouflage abilities, he was invaluable for reconnaissance. The amber dragon flew up to the observation window, hovering with an occasional wing flap. He patiently dangled in the air, awaiting for Jarvok's request. Los, bring Zion to me. Los chirped and flew down toward the combat courtyard. The cool breeze moved Zion's dark ponytail and he took it as a signal to don his helmet. Jarvok's second in command stood, armed with a wooden bow staff. 15 weepers encircled him. They all had sharpened spears pointed. Zion surveyed the circle and smirked. He lived for the fight, relishing a challenge. Come and get it, guys. The weepers collapsed on him. Zion jumped over the first few. Landing without as much as a thump or a cloud of dust, he quickly backflipped, kicking a charging weeper in the chin on his way over. The crunch of his foot connecting with the weeper's jaw fueled his excitement. He gained his footing and used his staff to sweep the legs of two more weepers who converged on him. Three more weepers stabbed at him. He dodged and parried their spears, using their momentum to throw him off balance. He thrust a front kick into one of them, which knocked the other two down, clearing his path. He side kicked another. Holding the end of the staff, he jumped and spun his staff around, hitting the remaining weepers. In two minutes, 15 weepers lay on the ground, nursing their wounds. Looking satisfied, Zion removed his helmet and handed his weapons to a nearby arsenal keeper. They nodded in appreciation as Zion stepped over the groaning weepers at his feet. Los waited outside the training circle for Zion to finish. The small dragon flew to keep pace with the tall power angel as he marched along, toweling off after his training victory. Yes, Los? Zion's eyes focused on the other training sets as they walked, tightening his lips to the sloppiness of the exercises. It's a thrust, then a parry, he yelled as he mimicked the movement. Sorry for the interruption, Los. Los motioned toward the observation window of the throne room. Zion stopped to look up the direction. Oh, 
King Jarvok wants to meet with me. Of course, Los, I'll be right there. Thank you. The dragon snorted and flew back toward the tower. Zion knocked and entered the throne room. To call it a throne room was incorrect. It was more of a strategy room, a map of the Court of Light and its fortress, along with the newly erected human villages sat in the center of a large table. Adjacent to the table was an impressive weapons wall, boasting each type of weapon Jarvok was proficient at wielding. There was a large chair carved from the molten rock of the crater Jarvok had made when he crashed back to earth the night he attempted to return to the gates of the Shining Kingdom. It was gray with a rough texture. The cooled magma had drip marks from down the side. It was unfinished, inelegant, and not at all graceful, but symbolic, forged in fire and strong as hell. It was the perfect throne for King Jarvok. His king stood at the observation window, his partially bare right arm with its fused kyanite gauntlet burned into the wrist behind his back. Zion knew this stance all too well. It was his king's contemplation posture. Jarvok was developing a plan. My liege, Zion announced himself. Jarvok gave him a quick glance over his shoulder. I have a mission for you. His voice was flat, but it usually was when a quest was involved. He closed the heavy black tourmaline double doors behind him, striding over quickly to his king. Zion stood shoulder to shoulder with Jarvok, eagerly awaiting his commands. I had asked Lois to gather information on the human worshipers regarding their rituals with the Court of Light. They are planning a rain ceremony for their crops. They want a blessing from their storm god or rain bringer. They call him Adid, better known as Arsaria of the Dynamera clan. He's a low level lord in his basic elemental play, water. Jarvat left the window and walked around the map, stopping and moving a few pieces here and there. He picked up a small, clear, quartz shaped crown figurine. Jarvok rolled it in between his fingers as he stared at the map. I want you to send a few weepers and kill Adid. Let the humans see us kill one of their so called gods. I don't follow, my liege. Zion met Jarvok's eyes, and a cold chill ran up his back as if an ice dragon had breathed on him. The king crushed the quartz crown into dust in the palm of his hand. Zion swallowed as Jarvok closed the distance between them. It's simple. I'm looking to provoke Aurora. I no longer wish to share or act as though we do not exist. I'm tired of the games the Court of Light is playing. Games, my liege? Zion's hand was at the back of his neck, no longer able to contain his confusion. While we may not have as many appearances to the humans as the Court of Light, Aurora cannot possibly believe the stories of monsters and dark gods the humans tell are all made up just to balance their light loving gods. If she does, then she's even more naive than I thought and even more of a reason for us to act now. I'll make her an offer. Aurora can either surrender her kingdom and stop allowing the humans to worship her in the court of light. If she does, then I will allow her to live in her little palace and all the fae that she has under her, or she can meet me on the battlefield and face certain oblivion. Either way, I win. The less court of light for the humans to worship, more power for us. I will not share our power base any longer. Take a platoon of weepers and go. Chaos be with you. Zion paused, his mouth abruptly closed as he tilted his head, trying to catch his reflex response of yes, my liege as it didn't appear to fit the king's usual exiting commentary. His sapphire blue eyes lifted to the magma ceiling. The irregular cones and points suspended above him held no answer to his riddle. The word chaos ran through his brain like Los hopped up on sugar plum wine, flickered and bounced. He straightened his spine and faced his king. He conceded his king knew best. Uh, yes, my liege, I shall be a creature of chaos, raining destruction upon Arsaria. Lowe stopped, scratching his ears upon hearing Zion's retort and wrinkled his nose. He folded his wings around himself and hunkered down. Jarvok observed the small dragon's reaction, a grin ghosting for a brief second across his face and his honey colored eyes melted into a pool of frustration. No, Zion, I did not ask you to be a creature of chaos. 
Zion's posture slumped. I do not understand. Jarvok leaned over the maps, staring at the figures and territories. He glanced up at Zion and then returned his gaze to the map. No, I suppose you do not. Zion joined him, scrutinizing what lay before them. Jarvok returned his attention to his second in command. To be a creature of chaos is to be used by the energy of discord, to be a tool of it. You are allowing confusion to lead you. I want more for us. We will take control of the pandemonium. Those who control chaos control their destiny. Do not let it lead you like a pet on a leash. He turned and walked to the window, hands behind his back. Now go and chaos be with you, Zion. Zion smirked. His blue eyes glowed with comprehension as his shoulders pulled back. No, my liege, chaos be with us. He turned and ran with a renewed vigor for his mission. Jorvok curled his lips up for a moment as he gazed out in the window and Zion's enthusiasm, but his stoic expression returned. He waited for the bang of the heavy doors and then exhaled. His shoulders slumped as the weight of his rule took him under. He leaned his hands on the window, the magma crumbling and sliding from his palms as the pressure caused small fissures to appear on the sill. His head hung low, his hair falling to his face as he raised those honey eyes to look out over the training yard. They'd need to train every day, do night formations. There would be no rest. The scent of cedar and sage wafted up from the bonfires below. He knew his plan to attack was sound, but his timeline was of concern. If Aurora continued to gather and unify her human worshipers, soon she could have enough magic to overtake his kin and force them into serving the virtues as their army. He thought of his kin living a life of servitude, and this caused Jarvok to force the acid back down his throat. No, he would not risk anyone gaining the upper hand over him. He had hidden his kin in the veil, established them as gods to the humans, and formed an alliance with the Draconians. He would not force the Draconians to fight alongside him against Aurora, but if they chose to stand with him, he would accept their help. He had been strategic in observing her and watching and waiting. She was naive, idealistic, and an egotistical ruler with no battle experience, an almost certain victory. By making an example out of a deed, the humans would fear his kin. And as Jarvok had learned, it was better to be feared than loved. One just needed to ask his creator. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside the Minds of Authors. We have Miss Danielle with us. Hi, madam. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I am so happy you're here with us today. I am so captivated with the story. There's so many moving pieces going on. I don't know who's a bad guy. I don't know who's a good guy. I don't know what's going on. So let's jump in. Tell us, where did this story come from? It came from a very unusual place, I will say. I was a nurse at a Lyme disease clinic and I had a patient who was undergoing treatment and where I worked, they dripped every single day, IV. So it was very aggressive and he had been dripping for about a year and kind of was tired of the medication. And so he had been traveling five hours, dripping for two and turning around and going home. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. So at that point he had said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore you need to kind of entertain me. So I said, well, tell me something interesting about yourself. And he said, well, I was recruited by the CIA out of college. So we made a couple jokes about, you know, all the conspiracy theories going on. And I said, oh, if you had just taken the job, we could have found out what was in Roswell and, you know, all the cryptid and stuff. And so we started joking about it. And I said, well, you know where Lyme comes from. And to this day, I don't know what made me say it. I said, the Fae. Don't know why. It wasn't like I was into fairies and the whole Fae you know, kind of trend. We started talking. He said, who are the Fae? And out of my mouth came angels who were locked out of heaven. Oh, And I don't know why. And so every day that he dripped, I would tell him a story about the Fae. And I put him in the story. So we just kind of kept talking and the story wove itself orally first. And then I wound up sitting down and writing it eventually. He was the one who encouraged me. He's like, you have to write this down. You just have to. And I'm like, yeah, sure. One day, maybe I will, you know, kind of thing. 
And then eventually I sat down and wrote it. And in about nine months, I wrote the first draft of the first three books. And it kind of just went from there. But don't know really where it came from. Your stories can come from anywhere. It's divine right. inspiration. So it doesn't have to have a specific place. But the mm-hmm. background is amazing. It just popped. It was funny because things that happened in the IV room, I would take and make it work. You know, the doctor had a big black Labrador retriever. And when he walked in, I was like, oh, and the dark day king had a dragon, big black dragon, and he came in. So it was just things that would happen. I would weave into the story. So it just kind of whatever inspiration hit, I used it. And that's where it kind of went. I love the fact that you were able to capture this verbal storytelling and still put it on paper. Because sometimes you say the story and it's just gone. So, you know, Mm -hmm. it was meant to be. Yep. It stayed in there. I feel like the Fae were kind of already in my head looking for a way out. And then they just were like, oh, this is cool. Let's go. And then they just went with it. So it was really cool. Oh, absolutely. It's very high fantasy, but I like the twist you have with angels, which is very unique. I love that (laughs) combination of it. Three books, nine months. Amazing. How many books are in the series? I am planning for 11, but We will see. I may be dividing some of them up because book one was originally one and two. And then I split it in half because it was just too big. And I may do that with the rest of them because as I'm learning, a lot of people, what they liked about book one was they felt it was easily digestible because it is high fantasy. They were kind of like, they felt like they weren't picking up the Bible, you know, so to speak. They said, I could get into the veil and get out of the veil. And they kind of liked it. Book two is a lot bigger. I may divide book two up as well. And kind of keep it at these 70, 80,000 word points. Because I feel like people can kind of get in and get out. And it's, I'll put it like this. You can date me without putting a ring on me kind of thing. As a new author, it's like, oh, I can jump in, jump out. I think spending money, especially in this day and age, you're not committing to a $35 book. And I think you have to be somewhat responsible and respectful of people's time in that sense and their money. I love the fact that you went smaller. My dad has a theory about it because time mm-hmm. is precious. Yes. And if people who are not used to reading large books tend to not to pick it up because they get intimidated. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Think about it. Most people are like, it's great. I don't have the time. So instead of trying to yeah. smell it, they're like, oh my God, I'm just never going to get to it. So they just leave it there. So that's a really good strategy. I thought about doing it in a novella standpoint. At what, you know, at one point I was like, maybe I'll kind of do a novella thing, but that 70, 80,000 word, it's doable. You can read it on a beach. You can read it on a plane. Even from an audiobook standpoint, that eight hours is like, oh, some people think of it in like terms of a bath, you know, because a lot of people like to listen to audiobooks when they're in the bath or when they're commuting. And it's like, oh, that's like a week worth of car rides. Cool. You know, you kind of have to think about people's time and be respectful. I think that's a problem with a lot of authors is they're too much like, I'm letting you into my world. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. They're taking the journey into your world. It's a privilege that they're taking the time, not that you're letting them in. Let's not get it twisted here. I think we have to be a little respectful of that. And I'm just happy when somebody's like, I read the book. I'm like, oh my God, you did? You know, that's awesome. Because I am not classically trained. I'm just happy that somebody's like, yeah, I'm going to go take a ride on the back of your dragon. I'm like, come on, let's go. I'll totally tour guide you. Let's, Let's jump on but I want it to be enjoyable. I don't want them to look at the book and go, oh God, I got to finish that book. It's the last thing I want. It's such a beautiful way of looking at it. And you're looking at your readers and you want to give them an experience Mm -hmm. that's going to blow their mind without overwhelming them. So I so appreciate it. That is awesome. As this series was morphing into your head and coming together, did you see any messages popping up? Because you're pulling from so many different things that I'm like, do you found common themes, common messages in them? When it came to messages, I think the biggest thing, like with the weepers in particular, I pulled a lot. My brother was in the army and he served during the second Iraq war incident, however you want to describe it. So I did pull from post-traumatic stress. That's what the weepers definitely represent. So that was a message I was putting out there without getting political because I didn't want to go that route if that makes sense. You know, I was trying to give people a release into the veil without being like, I'm going to get preachy because that's not what I wanted to do at all. But I do have symbolism in there for people to pick out if they want to. 
without putting it in their face. You're all about options and you're all about giving yes. your readers the choices and making the decisions and going on the strip. I like the symbolism. Yes. You keep saying the veil. What is the veil? Let's just jump to that. Let's get to that. The veil is the place where the Fae live and it's interdimensional. Originally, when the Fae are here, anybody can see them. There's no separation. You could be a human walking along the beach and there's Aurora hanging out. You know, there's Lady Serena just chilling. Once they meet with the humans and they have an interaction, they decide, oh, this is not good because if we're going to be your gods and goddesses, you should not be able to walk up and high five a god. <laughs> That's not a good thing. We need some mystery and we need to be protected. So they create an interdimensional portal so that they are veiled. And then she comes up with the name, the veil. And so it's what separates them. And it's almost just like it sounds. It's a clouding and a mirror aspect and to travel in. Jarvok then decides, well, if you got one, I want to get one. And he goes and he's like, well, then I'm creating my own, you know, kind of typical, I'm going to one-up you thing. So the Fae live in their own dimension that they can travel in and out of. You could be standing right next to one and not see them. And they could be right there in a forest. And it's their own little section of the world that they create. And just to keep them protected. So I like to think of it as, you know, it's Mount Olympus without being on a high mountain. That's and a good way of looking at it. They become our Greek, Roman gods, Egyptian gods and gods. There are polytheistic pantheon of the human race. So it's whatever you think. So if you hear, oh yeah, you know, you had to go to an Oracle temple to worship the temple of Adelphi or whatever, this is who they are. So wherever you need to see them, they'll appear. I like the twist that you're bringing to this definitely high fantasy. So tell me, as you got into this journey, what is your mm -hmm. definition of success? It's funny. I think when every writer, classically trained or not, starts out, we all have that, oh, I want to be on the New York Times bestseller list, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. And then you start realizing the game, because it's not until you're in it that you start figuring out that everything is a game. Oh, you know, for the USA Today, you've got to sell 5,000 copies from Tuesday to Tuesday. And oh, by the way, it only counts on Amazon the first 500. After that, they don't count this. And, you know, you start realizing there's a game to be played. And then once you're in it, you're like, okay, I want to make money. I want to do this. But not everybody's going to be J.K. Rowling's George R. R. Martin, you know. So at this point, the way I define success is someone enjoying my book and connecting with people. Yes, do I want to have a house where my Yorkie and my little Chewini can run out in the backyard? That's success, where I can literally just make a living from writing and I can touch people and connect with them. Would I like to be on a New York Times bestseller list? Hell yeah, everybody, you know, any author, any author who sits there and goes, it doesn't matter. It matters, okay? Let's just, let's just, it matters, okay? You all want to be on a bestseller list. Don't BS me. You want to be on it. We all know it. But the politically correct answer is new, new, new. Okay, look, I want to be on it. Will we get there? I'd like to think one day. But right now, success for me is, you know, I'd like to shoot for the stars this way. If I don't quite make it to the moon, at least I land amongst the heavens. I've had thing, interactions with fans that I never dreamed I would have. I've had fans ask me DM like over Instagram. I had one fan ask me, what are your fae? And it threw me off because I was like, they're fae. What do you mean? Like, that's what they are. And she said, um, no, like, what's their gender? And I said, male, female. And she's like, no, like sexuality. And I said, oh, they fall in love with the energy. They don't care what you are. They fall in love with the energy. I said, they fall in love with the energy, not the package. So as we were talking, the person said, oh, can I use that when I come out to my family tonight? And I was like, what? And it stopped me because I was like, huh? And they were like, I'm going to come out tonight. And I really loved your book, but I was a little confused by what they are because I've heard different scenarios. And she had looked at Lady Danius, who's one of my characters, and Lady Danius is in love with another Fae, who's a woman, General Jaden. General Jaden dies. And I was explaining their, their love story. And they were like, this really resonated with me. So I was like, cool. So I said, no, Fae will just fall in love with energy. They don't care about the package. So they said, okay, I'm going to use that. I fall in love with energy. I'm not concerned about the package. And I was like, rock on with your bad self. You want to use that? That's cool. 
they were like, well, I guess I came out to somebody for the first time. And I was like, wait a minute, you haven't told anybody? And they were like, no. And I went, okay. And I was that like, that is well, huge. I'm, I was like, thank you. And they were like, yeah, this is what I'm going to tell my family tonight. And I was like, awesome. Like, cool. And so they were like, I'm going to use your post and kind of like, this is how, I'm, but I'm going to say that. And I was like, and I remember getting off Instagram and going, okay, like, wow. And then I checked in with them a couple of times. I was like, how'd it go? You okay? You know, just trying to like, you cool. Every, and they were like, it was a little rough, but like, I'm getting through it. We're working through it. But saying I fall in love with energy helped. And I was like, cool. And I thought, you know what? If I don't make it on a bestseller list, like screw it. This was really important. What happened? I'm reaching someone like, yeah, okay. Maybe I only sold 10 books this week, but this made a difference. And that's where that kind of crystallizing moment happened where I was like, okay, so I have a grammatical error on page 81, whatever. The book resonated enough with somebody. It resonated to a degree that they want to use it in their lives. That's what yeah. it's all about. And I was like, that's pretty darn cool what we do. And that's where I think I had that first moment of like, I'm an author. Like, I'm not a nurse on the side. I'm not a personal trainer on the side. Like, there's all those things where I was like, that's kind of cool. And I thought that's success, that I was able to help somebody in a very small, small, small way, because what they did was brave on their own. And I will not take away from their moment. But if I was able to just pat them on the back for a second, put my hand on their shoulder and say, hey, you know, cool, you got this. Like, if I was able to help you with the words a little bit. And just give you that little nudge, like, cool. Hey, you know, I'm cheering for you. And pull a lady Serena, like, you got this, babe. Awesome. So I think that's more of a measure of success for me now than anything else. Ms. Danielle, that is powerful. And that is beautiful because you are making connections at a soul level. You know, mm -hmm. people reading it, they're connecting, they're seeing themselves in these pages and they want to take it to their lives. So absolutely. I love that. So tell me, madam, you have learned some huge lessons as she's starting out in this business and is a business, whether we like it or mm -hmm. not. And it comes yes. with some ups and downs. What advice would you mm -hmm. give an up and coming author? The advice I will give to anybody starting in this in general, I've always heard the, the term, you got to get thick skin. Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's just not. So don't go in here thinking you're going to get thick skin. You're just not. When you're creating, you can't have too much thick skin because I do feel it stifles the process. Don't think you're gonna come in and be like, oh, I'm not gonna listen to the bad stuff. You have to listen to the bad stuff. What you have to understand is the intention behind the bad stuff. The first thing you have to do is, you can say, don't take it personally. Once again, BS, you're gonna take it personally. It's your creation, it's your baby. You have to figure out when you write something, that was the place in time when you wrote it. It's almost like a blip on a radar. Okay, this was it right here. When you go to the next thing, don't move back. Understand that's when you wrote it. That's where you were. That's where your skill level was. The next one you write, you're going to learn from it. Don't keep looking backwards. Move forward, appreciate it, and move forward. That's something I'm still working on. Understand you have to do your own marketing. <laughs> Get someone to help you. I have Stephanie. Stephanie's absolutely amazing. Thank God I found her. But you're going to always have to do it, regardless of if you're an indie author, you sign with HarperCollins, whoever. You're always going to be working 24 7 on your stuff. That's it. You know, like no way out of this. There's just going to be bumps in the road, especially with your first book. Don't worry about it. If your story's good, if everybody's complaining, like, oh, you left a word out here, the brain auto corrects. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It's, is what it is. Write the book. Just write the book. Focus on it, that part. Just write it. If your story is good, and it's not a matter of if your story is good, they will buy it. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there will be mistakes, but if your story is solid, some of those things won't be an issue once the book is published. And if you're getting those complaints, yes, do what you can to fix it and all that stuff. But after a while, some of those things, you can't please everyone. I love that advice. And everybody who's listening and thinking about writing a book is true. Do you, boo, do your best. Give it your all and stall your stories. They'll love it. So tell us, madam, where can our listeners find you? Where can they find the book? 
the book is on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. What I am telling everybody though, is we have an amazing audio book coming out on August 10th. You can already pre-order it on audible.com, Birth of the Fae Locked Out of Heaven. Skyboat Media is producing it and doing the voices for it. And I've already heard a sample and it's phenomenal. Skyboat Media did Ender's Game series and they are doing it. And Stefan and Gabrielle are my Jarvok and my Aurora and like, they're just incredible. So anybody who's into audiobooks, just wait it out. August 10th, it comes out. You can pre-order it. If you're thinking about buying the book, do the audio book because man, it's, it's just to quote my friend Morris, it's off the chain. It, it's really good. So I would say go to audible.com or even Amazon has it right now um, for pre-order, but it's, it's really, really good. And then if you want to keep up on all things Faye, you can check me out at on Instagram at birth of the Faye underscore novel or birth of the and get a feel for what the Faye have got going on. And they have a lot to do. Awesome, madams. Before you leave us, we're going to switch gears. We're going to do our lining round. Easy peasy. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Ebooks or print? Print. Okay. If you had a choice, would you get a private jet or a yacht? Private jet. Gummy bear or sour patch? Gummy bear. Not bad. Mountain or beach? Beach. So here's a little different one. Let's see how you do. If you could have any superpower, what would you choose? Flight. Not bad. That's pretty cool. Madame, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'm so glad you joined us on the show. Do you have any closing remarks for us? First thing I have to say to everybody is obviously chaos be with you. Because I close everything out, chaos be with you. And now you know what that means. So that's my first thing. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's made Birth of the Fae possible you know, and I'm very excited for book two. So we're excited about that. And the audio book is really, really exciting. So that's been a dream of mine is to hear these voices out loud and, and to see Birth of the Fae come to fruition. And everybody who's helped me, Morris, uh, Jacob, Stephanie, bringing it all together. I thank you so much for having me. And to all my Fae friends who are out there, Denise, Julia, Mike, who have, you know, helped me bring Desdemona, Serena, Aurora to life. Thank you. So uh, I hope more comes out and we have more Fey experiences for everybody and they travel through the veil. I send you so many wishes and blessings and an amazing release for your audiobook. It's going to be fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us. To our listeners, go ahead, give Miss Danielle some love, find her on Instagram. Make sure to go ahead and like our podcast, share it with friends, invite them to join us. You know, growth is always better together. If you are enjoying the podcast and you want to support us, check out my Patreon account. It's Patreon backslash author DC Gomez. We're looking for subscribers to make sure we continue to bring amazing authors like Miss Danielle to you. So everybody, I'm out. I'll see you guys next week with another amazing author. Bye, everyone.